Okay, so thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, so, okay, this is the title of my talk. Uh, what I'm actually going to do, I, I'm also going to talk about this, but what I'm going to do is uh, try to answer this question. So, how many dimensions are there at the Planck scale? Which is a topic that has been touched already during this conference. And uh, actually, some of my answers were spoiled by Joao, but uh, that was uh, agreed on, so that's fine. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, to discuss a few. So, if we want to answer this question, the, the we first have to decide what is the notion of dimensionality that we want to use. Uh, and uh, here I will discuss a few. So one is a uh, spectral dimension that you might have uh, heard of already. Uh, the other one is the uh, Hausdorff dimension of momentum space that was mentioned by Joao before. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, another notion that I, I call quantum vacuum dimension that is then related to the actual title of my, of my talk. Uh, okay, so let's go with the first thing, so spectral dimension. Uh, so spectral dimension was, is uh, the most popular way that uh, quantum gravity researchers use when they want to discuss about uh, dimensions at the Planck scale. Uh, why, why is it? So here, let me first uh, say what is spectral dimension in a in the classical cases, so no quantum gravity. Uh, in this case, we have uh, we want to study the properties of some Riemannian manifold, and we do that via heat diffusion equation. Uh, this one here, where uh, um, uh, so this is a, a diffusion diffusion process from a point xi zero to point xi uh, during a time. S. Um, given the diffusion process, we can define the return probability density, which is the, prob the probability density of the particle that is undergoing diffusion to uh, come back to the point where it starts from. Uh, this is just the definition. Uh, then by evaluating the spectrum of the heat kernel here, uh, we find out that the return probability density can be written in this way. So it's just the sum over the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, so the delta here is, of course, the Laplacian defined on the, on the manifold whose properties we want to study. Um, uh, let me note uh, only that from here, you see that uh, if we uh, look at the return probability density for small values of the time s, uh, what we are going to probe is mostly the higher eigenvalues. Uh, and this is uh, useful for later. Uh, so here is just to show you that actually this return probability density, I it is related to the geometrical properties of the manifold. Uh, in fact, we can, uh, via the heat trace expansion of, the, um, of this, uh, we can expand the return probability density in these ways. And uh, so this is the diffusion time, and this is, these are coefficients. Here are just the first few ones. And you see that they are related to uh, uh, the mm, geometrical quantities that you can define uh, over, uh, over the manifold. Uh, and indeed, uh, 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 from the return probability density, you can define this uh, notion of uh, spectral dimension uh, that is uh, uh, just only tells you how uh, the, the return probability density is varying with respect uh, to the diffusion time, S. Yes. Uh, and uh, what it is found, and this is uh, just uh, standard, is that if we uh, look at a smooth Riemannian manifold, then uh, if the manifold is flat and is uh, d-dimensional, d small d, then uh, this uh, spectral dimension is going to be constantly equal to the dimension of the manifold. Uh, on the other hand, on a more general manifold, so a curved manifold, uh, we have that the spectral dimension uh, is varying, it's not a constant. In particular, for uh, small values of the diffusion time, uh, the dimension will match the actual dimension of the manifold. Um, and uh, uh, while for very large 
uh, diffusion times, it will go to zero. Uh, and the way it, uh, it goes from the value of d to the value of zero depends on uh, the properties of the manifold, such as the curvature and so on. So this is uh, 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 small values means uh, small values of s means that we are probing the manifold on uh, on uh, small scales, and that's why we get the same result as the flat space case uh, because it's locally we can approximate it as flat. While uh, for uh, uh, large values of s, we are probing the large scales. Uh, I guess so, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, uh, classical, but people working in quantum gravity have been trying to extend this uh, concept uh, to non-smooth Riemannian manifolds, so, so to whatever uh, they assume that is the uh, structure of space-time at very, very, at Planckian scales. Um, and uh, the way they have done it is uh, to consider a fictitious diffusion process on the whole of space-time. So the whole of space-time is the new manifold on which we uh, consider the heat diffusion process. Um, and uh, uh, then there is, of course, a fictitious time that is the diffusion time. So on one hand, the space-time, on the other hand, is fictitious time. And moreover, they have to consider a Euclidean version of space-time, of course, because the, uh, this diffusion process is, uh, uh, is defined on, uh, on a Euclidean uh, manifold. Then uh, it is uh, still true that uh, on, uh, the on the infrared, uh, the, uh, the diffusion process is probing the global geometries of the manifold. So in the infrared, we expect uh, uh, this uh, spectral dimension to actually give the same results that we would expect on a smooth manifold. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the uh, far UV, so for the diffusion time uh, going to zero, we expect uh, to be probing the, uh, the, quantum, the quantum regime. Uh, and indeed, it is found that so uh, in every model of quantum gravity has its own way to uh, compute the actual value of this uh, spectral dimension at and uh, its behavior in the far UV. But what is uh, uh, the general result is that uh, on very small scales, uh, the uh, dimension does not match anymore the classical dimension of the space-time. So there is a, a running not only to in, the, in the infrared, but also in the, in the UV. Uh, this is just a plot taken from this paper to uh, to show you what's going on. So this is for C three-dimensional CDT. It's a simulation. So in this case, they can actually simulate the diffusion process on the, uh, the space-time. And you see that in the infrared, uh, you get that... Uh, so this is a small scale here. It's a small compared to macroscopic scale, but it's big compared to quantum gravity scale. So it's a mesoscopic scale, let's say. So on the mesoscopic scale, we have that uh, they get three dimensions, which is what they started from. In the far infrared, they go, the dimension goes to zero, which is what we were expecting. But then you zoom in here, and this is what you get, that uh, the dimension is running from three down to somewhere close to, to two. Uh, and uh, this is the regime where where we are probing the quantum properties of space-time. And in this sense, you can say that for this model of three-dimensional CDT, uh, um, space-time is becoming two-dimensional in, uh, in the UV. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, you have heard something about this already in, uh, in the past days, but I'm going to repeat to also fix notation and so on. Um, um, uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, okay, you have all these models of uh, quantum gravity, each one has its own way to compute the spectral dimension. Uh, but from the spectral dimension, uh, once you have it, you can uh, deduce something about uh, other things of your model. For example, about what is, a, uh, what is the Laplacian of your model. Not in all cases we do have Laplacians for, 
for a quantum gravity theory, but uh, you can actually go from the spectral dimension uh, to the Laplacian and back. We have seen that uh, the definition depends on the Laplacian. Uh, uh, and in particular, you can, uh, you can show that uh, a running of the spectral dimension in the UV is associated to uh, the formation of the dispersion relation. Uh, so if I write the dispersion relation in this way, uh, so this, is, uh, this would be just k square in, uh, in the standard case, but it can be any function in principle, then you get uh, a deformed uh, Laplacian, of course, and then uh, this enters in your heat diffusion equation here, um, so that the return probability uh, is written in this way. Uh, and uh, here, here you is where you have the, the la you normally you have the, um, um, where the mass shell uh, enters. And uh, the spectral dimension uh, can be written in this way here. This was the relation between the spectral dimension and uh, um, the equation of motion was discussed in this paper in from 2011. Uh, uh, so the claim is that uh, uh, a running of the spectral dimension can be seen as a, a, a theory on uh, a theory with a, a deformed uh, Laplacian. Uh, this is one example that is uh, the example that Joao was considering and that we have seen that is very important for, uh, for cosmology. Uh, so if I take this dispersion relation, for example, here gamma is uh, some parameter telling me how the dispersion relation is modified, lambda is the scale where the modification becomes important. Uh, then I get the general result that the, that the spectral dimension in the UV uh, is this one. And in particular, you can see that for gamma equal 2, we get the running to two dimensions, which is what, what Joao focused on. But more in general, you get, uh, you get running. So this is the infrared value of the spectral dimension, which is 4. And these are two lines, where one for gamma equal 1 and one for gamma equal 2, and you see a running to different values of the dimension. Um, OK. Um, so this is a spectral dimension uh, that is, uh, is good because can be applied uh, to many models of quantum gravity. It's uh, one of the few things that can be actually computed in most models of quantum gravity. Uh, but I, I would say that it's not uh, extremely physical as a notion of dimensionality. So, uh, for example, because we are considering a Euclidean, Euclidean version of, uh, of the theory, so it's not the actual theory, it's a Euclidean uh, version of the theory, then it's not clear what, what is this uh, fictitious diffusion process that we are considering, what is this uh, diffusion time that we are considering. So uh, let's see if we can find a, some other notion of dimensionality that, that, is, uh, that makes a bit more sense from a physical and intuitive point of view. Uh, so in order to do this, uh, so this is uh, one uh, first option, uh, dimensionality of momentum space. Uh, so to go to the dimensionality of momentum space, uh, we can actually uh, start from uh, one observation, which is, so this is the definition of the spectral dimension that I have shown before. Here is where the dispersion relation enters in these three places. And, but these are integrals, and you can actually change variables in the integral. You're not doing anything. It's just a mathematical manipulation. And you can do it in such a way that the dispersion relation looks uh, standard, and all the uh, non-trivial, uh, all the non-triviality of the theory goes into the momentum space measure here and, uh, and here. Uh, and uh, uh, now it's uh, maybe an easier uh, model to look at, because you look at the uh, dimensionality of the measure in the momentum space, and you can uh, directly guess uh, what is the dimensionality of the theory that you are considering. So let's look at one example. Again, uh, the dispersion relation that we like because of the cosmological implications. Uh, we can change variable in the standard way, and uh, here is how the measure is modified. Uh, this is uh, in the UV limit, of course, which is what we are interested in. 
uh, and uh, from here we just uh, simply read the, the dimensionality of the measure. And uh, it turns out that uh, this is the dimensionality of the, the Hausdorff dimension of the momentum space that we are considering. Uh, so here it's three because I'm considering uh, three plus one uh, case uh, to start, to begin with. And uh, this is actually the exactly same expression that we had found for the UV value of the spectral dimension for the same model. Uh, and indeed, uh, for example, for gamma equal 2, we get again a two-dimensional uh, uh, two uh, measure. Uh, so uh, we are matching what we had found for the spectral dimension. And <laughs> no surprise, because we just change variables in the integrals. And uh, here is uh, one more general example. So here is a, a dispersion relation where not only we have higher, higher powers of the spatial part of the momentum, but we also have higher powers of the, uh, of the energy. And again, we look at the return probability. We change variables in the UV in this way here. Uh, and uh, we get uh, a probability density that is what we would have on a classical theory, apart from the fact that we have a deformed measure, which is all of this uh, thing here. And again, from all of this, uh, you can uh, just read out uh, the Hausdorff dimension of momentum space, and it turns out to be this. So it depends both on the higher powers you have in the energy sector and in the spatial uh, uh, momentum sector. Uh, and uh, this is not the end of the story, because actually within this framework we can show that uh, you can actually have dimensional reduction not only for Lorentz violating theories, so this is clearly a Lorentz violating theory, but you can actually implement direct, uh, dimensional reduction in uh, uh, theories that are relativistic even though they deform Lorentz symmetries. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, one example. So the way you build a, a, a relativistic theory when you have uh, a modified dispersion relation is uh, to accordingly uh, deform the measure of your theory so that the two things together are invariant under some deformed Lorentz transformations. And uh, uh, this is one uh, famous case. Uh, the curved momentum space with the De Sitter metric. So this is the metric of the moment on the momentum space. So this is not space time. Let's not get confused. Uh, and uh, from this, we just write down the measure as we would uh, write down uh, the covariant measure in a curved uh, space time. So it's just the, the determinant of the, of the metric. And uh, this is uh, the measure. Uh, and then uh, the, the, relati the relativistic symmetries of this theory are just the isometries of the De Sitter group, because this is just a De Sitter momentum space. And uh, of course, we also have to write accordingly uh, a dispersion relation. And uh, it turns out that uh, a dispersion relation that is actually a famous one, because it comes originally from the literature on the kappa Poincaré group, uh, it's uh, this one here. So this is uh, actually the, for who of you knows about what I'm saying, it's the Casimir of the kappa Poincaré algebra. Uh, this is invariant under uh, the isometries defined by this, uh, this metric here. And uh, more in general, we can consider any function of this Casimir to be the Laplacian of, uh, of the theory we want to study. And th this theory is going to be a relativistic theory. Um, so and uh, you can easily check by <laughs> actually uh, transforming all the quantities in here that the uh, return probability density uh, is uh, now it's uh, an invariant, invariant uh, quantity. Uh, and it is written in this way. So we have a deformed dispersion relation and a deformed measure. We have the two, of the two things together. Uh, but still, we can uh, perform a Ag uh, again, a change of variables, again, uh, here at uh, this level. Uh, uh, yeah, so that uh, uh, the dispersion relation uh, becomes trivial and the measure gets uh, even more uh, deformed than what it was already. So in the UV, this is the change of variable that you do. OK, this, uh, it's not interesting to look too much into the details. And uh, this is the final version of the 
probability di, uh, the, of the return probability density that you get. So it's the standard one with some uh, uh, deform measure here. And uh, again, we can uh, just from here uh, read out the dimensionality of the momentum space of this model. Um, and this is what we get. Uh, so again, uh, gamma is the power appearing here, so it's this one. And D is uh, the number of spatial dimensions we started from. Uh, and so this is uh, 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 one example of a theory with a, uh, of a relativistic theory that has running of the that has a running dimension at the Planck scale. Uh, and in particular, we see that uh, uh, for gamma equal 2, again, we can get uh, uh, running to two dimensions. So it is not true that, in general, that if you have a dim running uh, dimensional reduction in the UV, you need to break Lorentz symmetries. You can just deform, deform them and still uh, have a, um, a relativistic uh, theory. Uh, so how much time do I have more? OK, perfect. OK, uh, so this is uh, just uh, to put together what we uh, know until now. So I have told you that uh, the spectral dimension is uh, a very, uh, the running of the spectral dimension is a very common feature of uh, quantum gravity theories. It appears in several occasions. Here are just a, a few instances where you can find it, and uh, the usual. Uh, the, the most common value uh, for this uh, UV uh, dimension is uh, 2, and we have seen in uh, Joe's talk that actually this uh, running to two dimension is uh, very special uh, from the point of view of uh, cosmology. Okay, uh, but I'm still not very happy about uh, <laughs> the way we are characterizing the dimensionality of the at the Planck scale. So. Uh, first of all, we were still uh, relying on some Euclidean uh, version of the theory, and uh, okay, the spectral dimension has this problem of uh, this diffusion, fictitious diffusion problem, and uh, it still we uh, we don't know what we would like to actually measure directly uh, the dimensionality of uh, uh, um, the dimensionality of space-time. So we would like to have some more. Uh, uh, direct thing. And this is uh, where uh, I go to <laughs> uh, the title of my talk, uh, because I want to claim that actually uh, one way to measure dimensionality is to look at the vacuum fluctuations of the theory. Uh, and uh, okay, let's see. First of all, let's see how you, uh, you, do, you compute these uh, vacuum fluctuations uh, in a theory where uh, the um, dispersion relation is trivial and the measure is deformed. Uh, so uh, it's uh, in the variables where all the information about dimensionality is already contained in the, in the measure of the momentum space. Because I want to see if uh, this, if it, it, uh, this uh, information encoded in the, in the measure is actually something real or it's something that I'm just uh, making up. OK, so uh, we want to quantize a scalar field uh, that uh, has these properties here. Uh, so where uh, uh, I, I need to start from the covariant on shell measure. This is uh, just uh, the standard step that you do when you want to <laughs> do quantization of a scalar field. Uh, the covariant on shell measure can be written in this way. So this is the, the measure that appears here, but with the energy that is on shell. So this EP is not the Planck energy, it's uh, the on-shell energy. <laughs> Let's not get confused. Uh, and uh, this is the, the covariant on-shell measure. In the standard uh, 3 plus 1 dimensional case with the trivial dispersion relation, it's the well-known, it takes this well-known uh, form here. Uh, OK, then uh, we use, but uh, this is the standard one, but, and, but this can be general, this can be anything. Uh, then we expand our scalar field in the, in the usual way in terms of creation and annihilation operators. 
with the difference that here that is uh, there is the covariant on shell measure that could be that could be deformed. Um, and uh, the assumption that we have to make, but which turns out to be uh, to give a consistent framework, is that uh, one particle states uh, satisfy this conservation uh, relation here, which would be the standard one. So this one, if uh, so this is the, a delta function associated to a deformed uh, to the measure uh, mu bar so it's just the delta function that satisfies this relation when you integrate it together with the the correct with the correct measure uh, and this is uh, just the standard result in the standard case so it just gives you what you already uh, know from <laughs> Uh, quantization of a scalar field. It's just that uh, if the measure is different, then you get a different delta function because it still has to satisfy this relation, the, the, defini the definition of the, of the delta function. Um, uh, and actually, uh, I want to comment on whether this is a reasonable assumption also in, uh, uh, in theories that are in uh, DSR theories, so in uh, relativistic theories with deformed dispersion, with the um, deformed uh, Lorentz transformations. Uh, so maybe this, yeah, this slide is going to be more for people who know already something about it. But uh, so uh, if I want to, uh, to do this in the context of uh, Kappa Poincaré coordinates, so it's basically the, the sitter momentum space that I have discussed already before. Uh, so this is the measure that is the same that you have seen in a few, few slides ago, and this is the Casimir that is the same that you have seen already. Uh, then what is the problem at this level? Is that we know that for the theory to be relativistic, we, we, can, we also have to add uh, another modification to the theory, which is that the conservation rule of uh, momentum interactions are deformed. Uh, and, uh, and this means that also the conservation rule appearing for the uh, two-point function has to be deformed, and in particular, the, the, the delta has to contain, uh, has to be a delta of the deformed uh, sum of the momenta. And for the Kappa Poincare model, the deformed sum uh, takes this form uh, here. And the fact that you have to do this uh, was shown by very nicely by Michele in a paper from uh, 2011. So for details, you can go there and have a look. Uh, so, in principle, it seems that uh, this assumption here, it's, n it's not an assumption that you can do, that you can do if you want to uh, keep a relativistic invariance of the theory. Uh, but that's actually not the case, and uh, what is interesting is that it's not the case only if uh, you restrict yourself uh, to the two-point function. Because in only in that case, uh, when uh, you also take into account the fact that your uh, field has to be on shell, uh, well, because you, you are quantizing an on shell field, uh, then you can uh, rewrite the delta, this one here, so that the, at the end uh, you are left with the standard uh, delta with some energy factors in front of it. And uh, mm, what you find is that the energy factors in front of it are exactly the ones that that you get if you uh, explicitly write down uh, this delta function here, taking into account that it is the delta function associated to a deformed uh, a measure. So for the scopes of computing the, the two-point function, you don't care about the fact that you have a deformed uh, uh, sum rule in... Uh, uh, so it's valid in this base? No, it's valid in general. If you go on shell, it's... Uh, so it's valid also if you do it in, uh, for example, the linearizing coordinates that are the ones that would match within this framework. So the ones where the Casimir is trivial and uh, everything is in, uh, in the measure. It's just uh, a matter of going on shell and, uh, and doing the computation. OK. Uh, OK, so we have seen how to do the quantization, how to compute the two-point function, and now we want to compute the power spectrum of the of the perturbations, which is uh, something that uh, we can measure. That, that is something <laughs> that we can measure, and that is uh, 
uh, measured uh, in cosmology, as uh, Joe showed. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, so for example, in, uh, in cosmology, uh, the, the power spectrum of cosmology, which is the, the power spectrum that we want to be scale invariant in that case, is defined in this way here. Um, this is uh, the expectation value of, uh, of the curvature perturbation. The curvature perturbation is related to the scalar uh, field in this way. So there is a dimensionful uh, constant, which is the Planck length uh, in front of it. Um, so this is what we want to compute. To, to compute that, it is, easy to start it is easier to start from a, a, a covariant power spectrum that is defined in this way here. And this is the deformed measure of our theory. And the two spectra, just by comparing the two things and putting all the dimensionful constants at the right place, uh, they are related in this way. And this is a general relation. It doesn't depend on the specific uh, measure that we are considering. It's, uh, it's uh, general. Uh, here, mu bar, it's uh, just uh, what, uh, what appears here if you write the measure in, uh, in this way. So it is the relation uh, depends on the measure, meaning that the measure appears, but uh, the way it depends on the measure, it's always the same. So this is uh, general. And uh, another thing that is uh, <laughs> uh, another general result that is very useful is that this covariant spectrum here is always one, uh, regardless of the measure, regardless of the theory that we are considering. So then it's very easy to compute the actual power spectrum of the perturbations starting just looking at the measure, because then this is one and this is, uh, you just have to put in here um, the measure. Uh, so we can, uh, we can do it. So let's uh, consider a generic DH dimensional measure, uh, a covariant measure, yeah, which is the one that we are using. And uh, then uh, only by dimensional arguments, uh, we find out that this is the way that, uh, you in that uh, the way you generally generically write the uh, dh dimensional uh, measure. Uh, so here, this is uh, lambda is uh, the scale. Uh, it's the quantum gravity scale, the, the same that that has appeared before. Uh, this is uh, yeah, and everything else was already defined in the standard uh, case you get the, the standard uh, answer, just, for, just to check. Uh, OK, then we can use this general measure in the, uh, in the power spectrum. Uh, and this is what we get. So in, in the next slide is written uh, more clearly, putting to together all the, all the coefficients. So the power spectrum, in so this is now true for a general uh, measure yeah, I'm done. For um, in uh, in the h dimensions, so it's related to the Planck length, the quantum gravity length, the dimension, the spatial dimension of space-time uh, at the classical level, and then uh, uh, yeah, and then the the p that that is the one appearing here. Uh, so uh, first of all, one uh, uh, nice thing is that. When the dimension of the uh, momentum space goes to 2, the power spectrum is scale invariant, which is what Joao <laughs> uh, was talking about. So we, we recover uh, the scale invariance, uh, and uh, this is uh, nice. Plus, we see here how this uh, hierarchy between the Planck scale and the quantum gravity scale appears. So it, it just comes uh, from this. Uh, um, just naturally. A and this is uh, okay, already one uh, good result, but we can uh, stay here at this level, at the generic DH uh, level, uh, and compare uh, with, uh, what with the, the way that uh, in which usually the power spectrum is parameterized uh, by cosmologists, for example, which is this one. So here is the amplitude, and here is the spectral index. So just by comparing this with this, we get that there is uh, uh, always a relation, a direct relation between the, um, the spectral dimension and uh, uh, the dimensionality of momentum space. 
So now we have actually a, a physical notion of dimension because <laughs> uh, the you, you can always <laughs> uh, the the spec the um, two point uh, the the power spectrum of a, of a scalar field is something that you can actually measure. So this is a, uh, I would say a, a physical notion of um, of dimensionality. Uh, and I have only one uh, last slide where I want to comment on the fact that until now we have been talking about uh, uh, so this notion of dimensionality here seems to apply only to the momentum space, uh, but we wanted we, we would like to be able to say also something about what's happening to <laughs> the space-time counterpart. Uh, so is this uh, just running of uh, dimensions in momentum space, or is uh, something what's happening to the space-time in the meanwhile? They are related. We won't want to understand. And uh, this is uh, uh, what happens. So, so uh, it happens that all the quantization procedure that I have described before is consistent with uh, equal time commutation relations of this kind here, with the different measure here. Uh, and uh, just by looking at this and uh, asking that this is actually uh, some delta function in uh, space time, we can write down what would be a, a reasonable candidate for a space-time delta function, uh, which is this one. From the delta function, by just by asking that the delta function is related uh, to the measure in space-time by the usual uh, uh, definition, uh, you, you, can, uh, uh, you can write down the measure also in, uh, in space-time. Uh, and in particular, uh, what is uh, what is nice is that the, uh, it turns out that the delta function associated to the deformed measure I is related in this way to the delta function associated to uh, standard space-time. Uh, so basically, what happens is what it happens that the space-time is behaving. So this is a, sorry, the spatial delta only. The spatial delta is behaving as a standard delta in uh, dh minus 1 dimensions. So it seems that also on the space-time side we are having a, um, a dimensional reduction and uh, of the same kind that we had on the momentum space. So this is the spatial part, this is dh minus 1, and then you have uh, one uh, time dimension, so you end up with the dh dimensions in space-time. And the last thing, what is very nice, is that on the space-time side you have that the separation between uh, time and space uh, remains even uh, uh, when you do the dimensional reduction. This is not something that happens on the uh, momentum side. On the momentum side, when you do the dimensional reduction, energy and momentum get all mixed. And okay, you know that the total dimension is uh, going down, but you don't know what's happening to spatial part and uh, energy part of, uh, of the momentum space. But on the space-time, you, you keep having your time that <laughs> apparently is not affected by the dimensional reduction, and then the dimensional reduction happens on the purely space uh, side, which is something cute, I would say. And with this, I conclude. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So co coming back to this uh, phenomenological part, I uh, Okay, at least naively, it looks like this can also kill your theory, right? Because, because w once you allow this, this, this guy to fluctuate, then you should take into account the exactly same fluctuation in the, let's say, in uh, correcting the kinetic term of other particles, like standard model particles, let's say neutrino or an electron. But if the co they it will give you a similar coefficient. Well, it depends on, uh, I mean, you have to assume uh, how this would couple to that. No, but uh, gravity, you that see, uh, this is gravity. This is not gravity, this is a scalar field. Here I'm doing a scalar field. So, so I'm, is, not, uh, I'm like not assuming, so I, I don't know what, scalar field. I, I'm just doing scalar field yeah. in a, a model where uh, the measure is deformed. No, I understand. But and uh, I'm not doing anything else. No, no, uh, but if you want to do more, of course you have. <laughs> you need to have a more uh, a no, but you, a you better constructed theory. No, but you said that this is a theory of quantum gravity. That's what you said. This is a, a model for uh, quantum gravity. So in then quantum gravity, we know that uh, dimensionality. It's ha something has happened to dimensionality, 
and uh, this is uh, No, I'm just saying that you compute two loop diagrams in this theory and you will penetrate this breaking to the standard model particles. You, I don't see how you can avoid it. No, but here, I mean, here there are uh, no standard model particles. Uh, it's, uh, this is a toy model, if you want. It's, uh, you would have to but know... You understand what I, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, but you, you would have to know... You understand my comment, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, you are saying that uh, the effects of these would propagate... Necessarily, because this necessarily, but couples to gravity, and gravity couples to everything But you else. don't know, because gravity might be conformally coupled, and then uh, nothing couples to gravity. So <laughs> you don't know what's happening at that scale. Uh, we, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. So no, this then is not... Then <laughs> then, uh, then the I mean, uh, what you're saying is that, okay, then we have to ask uh, that uh, gravity does not couple to the rest of the particles. No, which sorry, would, uh, could be... No, sorry. Ada, you admit that there is an issue that I'm raising. You cannot just dismiss. You, you are telling no, no, me. No, 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 it's not You that are giving a talk and saying that you have a theory, or at least a model of quantum gravity. I'm trying to be constructive. No, no, I don't have a model I mean, of quantum gravity. I want to gravity. help you because it's very nice to have phenomenological predictions, and, th and you are trying to dismiss uh, it. No, say, no, 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 no. I'm saying that <laughs> this is not a, mo a full mo theory of quantum gravity. This is a model... Uh, a very simple model, it's not a, a, th a theory for quantum gravity. From what you say, of course, I it follows that uh, the full theory will have to couple to gravity in such a way that uh, the effects are not propagated. Yeah, but I mean, it's, I I and I mean it's a big problem. It, of course, it's a big problem. But but I'm not uh, saying it's a problem. I'm saying I didn't compute it. I'm just saying the on, the, on the first reaction, I think it's a, there, is, uh, there is a very interesting thing. You could just, even after this talk, sit down and estimate. And yeah. maybe you can tell me that there is no problem, that the separation... Yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know, if because do I didn't loops, uh, because write down the two-loop factor, will be this factor, stuff like that. It's a very interesting phenomenological question. And, uh, it's yeah, that yeah. you are trying to say, no, 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 it's... In no, no, I don't want to say that it's not uh, interesting, it's super interesting, it's Most just that... The most interesting part in this is that you can predict something, that's why you are showing this 10 to minus 5, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, uh, the, the issue is there, of course. You have uh, two momenta bases. In one basis, you have uh, just the usual Klein-Gordon form of the mass shell, but the measure is non-trivial. In other, it's opposite. I mean, so in uh, can you tell me uh, how you add the momenta in this basis in which you have uh, uh, just a trivial measure? I mean, I mean the standard measure. Uh, what because you in said it's complicated. No, so for when you have a, when you have a mass shell, Klein-Gordon mass shell, but. But in the other case, what, what, is the, what is the addition law? Is it a billion or a billion? So you, you start from one base. So you're talking about the kappa Poincaré case, I guess. No, so I'm talking about your talk. I mean, because you are writing for, P, so for P plus Q. I mean, so, so what does it mean, P, P plus Q, in this basis where you, uh, uh, where you have just this complicated Casimir? Is it is just kappa Poincaré? So, uh, in the, so the issue of the addition is relevant sure. in the kappa Poincaré because there it's where you need to modify the addition to be relativistic. In the other cases that I have considered, uh, it, they are Lorentz breaking. So I, there I just consider a standard addition rule and that's uh, not a problem. So you just uh, change, change the, vari the p variable, it, yeah? Yeah, okay. in the other cases, Okay, yes. so if you have your, your addition law the same as in the kappa Poincaré, so there is a whole bunch of papers, even there are papers about the, 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 the quantized free fields, where you have really done everything rigorously with the covariance under Kappa Poincaré. So this is a kind of poor copy of these things which we do in Kappa Poincaré. Everything okay? is a copy. <laughs> okay, uh, because, uh, because you just, I mean, the thing which you did here is just to go to the coordinate system which, of yes. course, is also considered for Kappa Poincaré systems. It means called so-called free bases, in which you have uh, just the, 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 the classical Poincaré algebra. And, of course, you have all these things that uh, have been calculated. But I think the fields, of course, you obtain by the change of variables. And you need for your uh, Hausdorff dimensions. So this, this point is just, just I would say, I would, I w for me, it's uh, just uh, uh, an element which is original in this stuff. So the, rest so is the quantization kind of in Kappa Poincaré has been studied uh, no, already. The rest, That's the rest uh, I mean, if you, if you would look at the, at the, if you would look at the, at the, at the uh, for example, papers on, on, on fields, which uh, mm -hmm. uh, are a kind of uh, yeah, the mean, uh, three fields. So one example where this has been done is this paper, and uh, I'm sure there are uh, other works oh, that in, in, the, oh, oh. in the Kappa Poincaré. This is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the first paper in Rome which has been discussed this. I, I can comment mm -hmm. like this. Okay. Thumbs up. But make sure that the question is 
short and the answer is going to be even shorter. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, yes, will, I, yes, I will, no I'll, question. Look, I'll just go back to what uh, I said exactly with draw case. Namely, if you look at the amplitude of the spectrum, it's LP over lambda squared. And that means that somehow the scale lambda at which the, this sort of running of the spectral mm -hmm. dimension kicks in, it, it's 10 to the pi. Now, in yep. Planck units. But if you look at Benedetti's graph you know, from 2009, you actually see that the significant running occurs only at the Planck scale. Again, but that's a... Uh, if you take that Benedetti's plot, the phase value, then you, will, you can actually say your lambda is, let's say, 1 in Planck units, and then the amplitude is 1 in Planck units. And yeah, so this so would... So so no, no, this would mean that uh, that specific model there is not compatible with the data. But that that specific the model, uh, then uh, there could be... A <laughs> but that's only one... Yeah, it's a one quantum gravity okay, model. Uh, there are... So you say that that your, your calculation <laughs> out the CDT model because it gives you, it, yeah, it gives yeah, you yeah, large, it's it gives you large quantum fluctuation without inflation, of course. Yeah, but without, no, no, no. But then you just say that you still need inflation to, to actually, you know, in some sense, inflate the spectrum. I mean, no, it's going to be what you want. One scale just means that's it. You want. Yeah, this is a... Uh, it stays all the one. In that case, uh, it would probably stay, and uh, this would tell you that that model is not a viable model, okay, or at least me which one is. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. I would get a Nobel Prize now. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, so 